Africa to be testing ground for trust stamp vaccine record and payment system, a biometric digital identity platform that evolves just as you evolve, is set to be introduced in low-income remote communities in West Africa thanks to a public-private partnership between the Bill Gates-backed Gavi Vaccine Alliance, MasterCard, and the AI-powered identity authentication company Trust. If it hasn't come clear for you, it's pretty much here in this first story from mintpressnews.com. And I actually talked about this a couple mornings ago on my morning show. Africa to be testing ground for trust stamp vaccine record and payment system. A biometric digital identity platform that evolves just as you evolve is set to be introduced in low income remote communities in West Africa thanks to a public private partnership between the Bill Gates backed. Gavi Vaccine Alliance, MasterCard, and the AI-powered identity authentication company Trust Stamp. That is their proper name. The program, which was launched two years ago, will see Trust Stamp's digital identity platform integrated into the Gavi MasterCard Wellness Pass, a digital vaccination record and identity system that is also linked to MasterCard's click-to-play system that powered by its AI and machine learning technology called New Data. It's only just missing the umlauts, James. MasterCard, in addition to professing its commitment to promoting centralized record-keeping of childhood immunization, which is exactly what you expect MasterCard to be involved in, also describes itself as a leader towards a world beyond cash. And now we're getting, of course, to their mission statement. MasterCard's partnership with Gavi marks a novel approach towards linking a biometric digital identity system, vaccination records, and a payment system into one single cohesive platform. The effort since its launch nearly two years ago has been funded by a $3.8 million Gavi donor funds, which of course was matched exactly by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I don't know, $7.6 million isn't really all that much in fiat currency, but that's still a whole heck of a lot than we have more here on our side. In early June, Gavi reported that MasterCard's wellness program, wellness pass program, would be adapted in response to COVID-19. Around a month later, MasterCard announced that Trust Stamp's biometric identity platform would be integrated into Wellness Pass as Trust Stamp system is capable of providing biometric identity in areas of worlds lacking internet access or cellular connectivity. It also does not require knowledge of an individual's legal name or identity to function, which will be a great way to sell this to you. It's not your identity. The wellness program involving Gavi, MasterCard, and Trust Stamp will soon be launched in West Africa and will be coupled with a COVID-19 vaccination program once a vaccine becomes available. James, also, I hear news that uh, the first 100 customers will get a free blanket with cooties. As we laugh to not cry. James. That's it. Um, Well, James, this is exactly, exactly what I was talking about in Bill Gates and the Population Control Grid. It is this the coming together of all of these pieces of the puzzle. It's the biometric identity grid with the vaccination history grid with the cashless payments all coming together into this one package that's going to be delivered to you, of course, via Gavi and uh, which obviously has Bill Gates links and MasterCard and all of these other corporate entities are coming together to offer you the solution to the crisis that they war gamed out on in October of last year. Wow, imagine that. What are the odds? So at, at the very least, I, I would hope people would go and read through this article. There are so many links to different pieces of this and trust stamp and what is that and who's the corporate partners and how did this come together and what's it seeking to do and how does it function? There's so much to explore, even just from this one article that I think is very important knowledge for people to have uh, to understand how this is going to play out. Not just, obviously, they roll it out in Africa first because, hey, they're the guinea pigs because this is a big eugenics experiment anyway, but it is coming around the world in one form or another. And I think people should be aware of that. So it is good to inform yourself, but also this is a good article to follow up with people who you might have tried to share Bill Gates and the Population Control Grid or other information with, oh, you silly conspiracy theorist. Well, here it is. It's already arrived. They're already doing it and they're rolling it out. And here's the first test and here's how it works. 
uh, it's a good way to back people into that corner where they're going to have to say, well, of course it exists, but it's a good thing. How else would you want to keep track of people's biometric identification and vaccination history and also put them on the cashless payment grid? How else is this going to work? So it, at any rate, I hope that this will be one of those things that helps a few of those seeds that have been planted to flower, because this is exactly what I was pointing to in that work just a couple of months ago, and it's already arrived. It's already arrived again with, you know, years and decades and generations of planning, but they can spring it on people like it. It just happened, you guys. A thousand. Uh, policy of the American government is called the Kissinger Report, which was produced in the mid 70s when Henry Kissinger was the um, was involved with the government. And it explicitly states, which to this day, it remains the official policy of the American government. It has not changed. Mm -hmm. may not be implemented by mm -hmm. Trump, but it remains the same. That uh, the purpose of the foreign policy in Africa was to uh, reduce the, the population. So to give aid to countries in Africa, not uh, clean water and schooling and things like that, but uh, contraception and abortion. In order to re shrink the population of Africa because they have great mineral resources there. That sounds diabolical. It I mean, is. I, I, yes. That sounds like something conceived in the mind of Margaret Sanger. Yeah, definitely. And so the, uh, at the time, Kissinger and those involved with the Carter administration wanted to shrink the population, make sure that the Africans do not develop and do not use the resources for themselves. Because we in the States, we need them. There is a, a concerted effort of foreign powers to uh, control the population of Africa. Africa is a huge continent, could, mm. could feed thousands more people, but the uh, policies of the West, especially in, in Europe. For example, between 1990 and the year 2000, the United States, Canada, and Europe contributed about $6 billion in contraceptives, not to help the people, not to give clean water, clean food, uh, that mm. is uh, not, not to fight malaria, for example. No, of course, to perish the thought, never yeah. let them die. That's the whole idea. So, in our work in HLI, we denounce this reality to make the Africans aware that they have to defend themselves against the, the influence of foreign powers. Senator Scott Jensen, I represent Carver County. This is one of the most important videos I've made, and one of the hardest. Frankly, it's been a very difficult decision to make whether I even wanted to do it. Less than a week ago, I was notified by the Board of Medical Practice in Minnesota that I was being investigated because of public statements I had made. They listed two allegations. They said, I've been spreading misinformation in regards to the completion of death certificates on a news program, which happened to take place on April 7th. And you could find that one. It was with Chris Berg if you wanted to. And the other allegation was that I provided reckless advice in my willingness to compare COVID-19 and the flu. When I got this letter, I was ticked. And quite frankly, I leaned into the comfort and wisdom of my family to help them, let them walk me, talk me off the cliff. But doggone it, if this can happen to me, my view is it could happen to every, anybody. I mean, I've been a family doc for 40 years. I work hard, I love my patients, I do house calls, I've been medical directors, I've held staff positions in hospitals to help make things work better. I've been in the Senate for four years and I've learned a lot. I've never had anything like this happen. Shoot a mile. Five years ago I was named the Minnesota Family Doctor of the Year in Minnesota. And I get this because a couple people complained and I don't get to know who those people are. I don't know if they're routinely in a political camp, if they're activists. I've gone online and looked at what it takes to complete a complaint that the Board of Medical Practice has to follow up on. It's a one-page deal. You can say what you want. You could be a huge donor for the other party, and I wouldn't get to know it. I wouldn't get to know if you live in my district. I don't, I don't get to know anything. I checked. So, here I am. I've spent the better part of the last six days preparing a response. 
I understand how important the work is that the Board of Medical Practice does. I mean, physicians do screw up. Two of the big areas where physicians mess up is inappropriate sexual behavior, inappropriate self-medicating, certainly with opiates. But this is an odd position for me to be in. And I am just stunned. But I should have seen it coming. Because I saw the threats on social media. I've seen them for the last two or three months. I've seen them come from physicians. I've seen them come from people in all walk of life. They didn't agree with me. They didn't like it. That I was trying to provide some context for the flu, for COVID-19. We've had some 35, 40,000 cases of COVID-19 in Minnesota thus far. According to the Department of Health people, that might translate into 10 times that many. And if it does translate it 10 times, I mean, that's 350,000 cases. But in 2018, we had more than a half a million Minnesotans with the flu. When I say that, am I recklessly giving you advice regarding COVID-19 and the flu? Dr. Anthony Fauci has come out and compared them all the time. Dr. Mike Osterholm has. In terms of the death certificates, on April 3rd, I got an email from the Department of Health that said very clearly that we should report COVID-19 on death certificates if it is assumed to have caused or contributed. Well, that's not how we do death certificates. The official ICD-10 coding for April 1st, 2020 through September 30th, 2020, during the time frame in question, says this. If the provider documents suspected, possible, probable, or inconclusive COVID-19, do not assign U07.1, which is COVID-19 disease. It says, assign a code explaining the reason for the encounter, such as fever, or a cough, or shortness of breath. That's what the official instructions say. So I get this on April 3rd. I end up inadvertently sort of accidentally running it up the flagpole with Chris Berg on April 7th. And what happens? The Department of Health, a few days later, comes out with a clarification. And then a few weeks later, they come out with another clarification. And I appreciate it. Fact of the matter is, I'm proud of the Department of Health in Minnesota for saying, we are not going to list non-confirmed cases as deaths in Minnesota. We are gonna put an asterisk by them and we'll follow up on those later. But that's not what Pennsylvania was doing. That's why they had to subtract 200 patients from their COVID-19 death count. And Colorado did the same thing. New York went the other direction. New York said, we're having more deaths in a certain period than we normally have, so those deaths must be COVID-19. We just didn't pick them up. So never mind the testing. We're adding 3,700 to our total, and oh, well, that does increase our total by 50%. So I'm in the position where I have to explain that I wasn't spreading misinformation. And I'm not being reckless when I talk about COVID-19 and the influence of both being single-stranded RNA viruses that are respiratory in nature with similar symptoms and can be spread through particulate matter and aerosol transmission. I've got an eight-page document that I put together for the Board of Medical Practice. And let me be clear, they do important work and I'm gonna fully cooperate with them. I also have some 70 pages of attachments. And in the attachments, I've got the Pennsylvania Department of Health slashing their numbers by 201. I've got the Department of Health in Illinois where one of the directors says that just because we put COVID-19 down on the death certificate as cause of death, that doesn't mean the patient died of COVID-19. She said that. Dr. Fauci, when he talks about influenza, he was the lead article in this New England Journal article, and he said this, if one assumes that the number of asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic cases for COVID-19 is several times as high as the number of reported cases, the case fatality rate may be considerably less than 1%. This suggests that the overall clinical consequences of COVID-19 may ultimately be more akin to those of a severe seasonal influenza. That was Dr. Fauci. And, oh, by the way, one of the contributing authors was 
Dr. Robert Redfield, the head of the CDC. Dr. Osterholm is a well-regarded epidemiologist. And he was saying this in the, in the middle of March. He said, the flu has become a pandemic more than once and has killed millions of people. It still exists today. Unfortunately, we now have on our hands something else, but it's caused by coronavirus, which is acting very much like influenza. Folks, do I feel targeted? Yeah, I do. Do I know who my accusers are? No, I don't get to know. Could I be disciplined by the Board of Medical Practice? Well, sure I can. There's two allegations they're investigating. If I have been spreading misinformation, then what about Governor Walls in the Department of Health? Right around March 1st, we had a Department of Health memo that talked about the purpose of, if you will, some of the measures that would be taken to dampen, delay, and decrease the peak, to allow the accumulation of PPE and make sure that our hospital capacities weren't being overwhelmed. In that memo, they say what effective measures are. Cover your mouth. Don't go out if you have cough or fever. Avoid touching your face, your eyes, or mouth. Cover your mouth if you cough. Wash your hands frequently. Minimize outings. Socially distance. But what did they say were not effective measures? They said wearing masks is not effective. Taking antibiotics is not effective. A month later, Governor Walls comes out, talks about 74,000 Minnesotans dying. Later on, he went back to 29,000, and right around then, I put a different video out saying just the facts. And I said, I'm not buying 74,000 Minnesotans dying. I'm not buying 29,000. And then this one came out a month later, right around May 1st. This is a model that they're using. And it says on here, Minnesotans model projects nearly 1,000 deaths a day in mid-July. Well, folks, that's next week. So far, we have less than... So right around 1,500, of which all but 300 of them have occurred in people in long-term care facilities, in large part because the Department of Health participated in decisions that put people with active COVID-19 disease in the nursing homes. And I'm spreading misinformation. Of course I am. I don't know what to tell you. I just know this is wrong. We're in a bad place. My wife asked me the other day, Scott, why did 911 pull us together as Americans so much? And why is COVID-19 breaking us apart? I think physicians are part to, part to blame. Scientists are. We've become so darn political. Physicians and scientists in the past are supposed to be above the fray. <laughs> They're not. I have this odd set of hats I'm wearing because I'm the Vice Chair of the Health and Human Services Committee in the Senate, and I'm involved in policy discussions, and involved in bills that deal with providing relief for COVID-19, and on the other hand, I've been a physician in the trenches for 35 years. So I try to connect the dots. I don't try to present myself to be something I'm not. I'm not an epidemiologist, but yes, I've taken epidemiology classes. I'm not an infectious disease doctor, but I take care of infectious disease every day. I just want to leave you with a couple of questions you could maybe ask yourself. Do we think it's okay for physicians to certify in death certificates that someone died of COVID-19, even if there was never a COVID-19 positive test obtained, even if there was never a COVID-19 test done, even if a COVID-19 test hadn't even been considered? And maybe the worst even if, even if the family had no clue that the death certificate they received for their loved one was gonna say COVID-19. What do we wanna be doing there? In Minnesota, I think the Department of Health is taking care of business. Those are important questions. I'm sure there are naysayers out there that think that I'm getting exactly what I deserve. Fine. If it can happen to me, I think, frankly, that it could happen to anybody. It feels ugly. 
It feels like some of the people that disagree with me don't want to have a conversation. I've asked many of you to have conversations and you've not been interested. So, reckless advice regarding comparisons between COVID-19 and the flu. Spreading misinformation because I cried foul when I received a memorandum from the Department of Health on April 3rd which directed me to a CDC link which says clearly that you could have a patient suffering from other medical problems, wheelchair bound, severe stroke within the preceding year or two, no COVID-19 test ever done or ordered, and when that patient dies of pneumonia, it's a COVID-19 death. I cried foul. And I'm grateful that the Department of Health, a week later, tried to clarify things, and a month later, clarified it further. But I'll say it again. The official people who write the coding Bible in this country said, if the provider documents suspected, possible, probable, or inconclusive, do not assign COVID-19. 